Um, so my name is uh, Tom Deckers. Um, I'm an IT architect. I'm in the Cisco IT services organization. <clears throat> and um, so what our team does is basically working with two groups. One is uh, we work with the application teams, and we teach them, we educate them on how to build cloud-native applications. And the um, other group of people we work with is basically the infrastructure teams, right? So we um, work with infrastructure groups within the company um, and help them understand what are the requirements, right? So what are application teams looking for? So um, those are basically, um, that is basically what our group does. Um, so what I'll do today is kind of talk a little bit about fast IT um, and then how we've been uh, implementing that inside of the company, right? So fa first, a um, few points on fast IT. So um, basically, it's a model that Cisco come up, comes up with um, to maximize your infrastructure investment, right? So we want to make it as efficient as possible and get the most out of your uh, infrastructure. And the way that works is basically focused on a few points, right? And I highlighted a few of them. Um, so first one is um, the programmable infrastructure. Um, that is basically all about APIs. And you have to take infrastructure really broadly here. So it's not just um, the networking and the plumbing, but it's actually uh, infrastructure, platforms, and everything that is needed to build applications, right? So um, all of that needs to be API enabled so that you can wire it up into the next step, which is then automation, right? So Automation and uh, orchestration, that is basically putting your APIs to work. Um, so you want to not only orchestrate within specific domains like infrastructure, but you also want to um, wire up these different domains. So you want to automate across infrastructure, platforms, applications, and all the tooling around it. Um, so you want to break those boundaries. So you want to break the boundaries up the stack, but also um, if you have global deployments, you want to break the boundaries between physical and virtual. So you have different OpenStack deployments, for example, in various data centers across the globe. So how do you basically make workloads go from one data center to the other one? Um, so that is something um, where, for example, something like intercloud comes into the picture, right? So how do you take these virtual machines or workloads and transition them from one location to the other? So that is bridging physical gaps. Also, a lot of automation involved there. So now we have applications basically um, scaling up and down. We have them deployed globally. You want to maintain the visibility, right? So automation um, hides a lot of complexity. It gives you a lot of, um, of this agility, but you still want to get um, visibility into what is happening, right? So there is the magic that is happening, but you also want to understand the magic. Um, and then a really good use case to illustrate it all is um, automated threat detection. Um, so you can't have um, this or a man, or person manually logging into boxes and, and trying to respond to um, a security breach, right? Because by the time a guy figured out what is wrong and he logged into a few boxes, it's already too late and your data is gone, right? So you want to be able to automate that. So that's one of the, the use cases we use typically to illustrate the value of fast IT and uh, where we want to go with it. So we have a nice website that talks about it in depth, right? So instead of you remembering the URL, I thought I'll just put up the <laughs> QR code so in case you want to scan it. So that's also about being agile and <laughs> putting the APIs up there, right? So all right, fast IT. Um, did you guys hear about this before? I mean, did you attend sessions where they speak about fast IT? Yeah, all right. At least some of you have. Definitely check it out. Within the company, we have a program called IT Delivery Transformation. Um, and that is really about um, putting that fast IT to use, right? It is not the way to implement fast IT, it is a way, right? And we just today will focus just on a few aspects of that. First, metric. So we have three metrics we capture here. First metric is around time to capability. That is probably the most obvious one. Um, that is all about shortening the cycles for writing your code and putting it into production and everything that has to do with that, right? So you want to, this also resonates very much with the agile development methodology. So you want to be able to kind of quickly get your code into a development environment where you can then um, basically get feedback from your business users and, and, and um, get that loop going, right? So that is all about um, the time to capability. So it is end-to-end -end project delivery, but it is also within the project um, doing the different iterations. The uh, second one here is software quality. Uh, that one might be a little bit less intuitive. The reason why we talk about quality here is because um, 
if you iterate through these um, cycles, right, you can also embed your uh, quality um, testing in there. And you, instead of the traditional way where you have application teams deliver code within weeks or months, and then you get into a QA stage, you get different people analyze the code, and you, you have different people look at functional testing. They provide feedback and then get it back to your developers. Right? There is a long time between the development and your testing cycle. So developers get out of the context. They don't know exactly what they were doing in the code. They have to relearn what happens and then go and debug it. Right? So if you have these cycles much faster and you include software quality testing um, as part of your development cycle and you do that very rapidly, you can just send reports the next day. Like, look, you did this little mistake. Go and fix it. These guys have it fresh in their minds, and it's easy for them to fix. Right? So that's also part of it. Um, actually, the value of, uh, that we're trying to get out of this cost of delivery because we automate a lot, and I'll show you in a minute. I actually have a demo for you as well where I show some of these things that we've implemented. Um, because we um, automate provisioning not only of the environments, but also of the uh, software delivery cycles, right? Uh, the del delivery pipelines, um, we're able to work with much smaller teams, right? All they have to focus on is um, the code development, their business logic, and everything else like um, setting up infrastructure, middleware. Um, development pipelines, everything like that is provisioned for them, right? So they go through, the, through a catalog, they request a service, they click a few buttons, and all of that is being set up for them, right? So that's, that saves them a lot of time and uh, allows them to just focus on their core business, which is writing business applications. And then as it says here, it, it kind of comes with a mindset change, right? Um, so it's really a cultural sh shift. Um, people have to get used to the, this type of automation and uh, the agility that comes with it, right? Also, the way that they interact with uh, the business teams, they have to kind of get used to cycling through that, getting fast feedback, uh, and what have you. This is what it looks like. Um, so it's fairly straightforward, and this is not rocket science. I think if you're familiar with development cycles, this is something that you've seen before, right? So developers. They use their IDE, they write code, check it into the version control systems. Easy enough. Next step that happens is we have Jenkins set up that gets it from the code repositories. We start automated testing through AppScan. Um, all kinds of testing we have configured, um, code quality testing, documentation, security testing, that is actually part of that, right? And then the next step, we push that to, um, or the result of the build is basically um, pushed to Artifactory, where we keep the deployment artifacts. And then we have um, a deployment application in place that looks at Artifactory, takes these um, deliverables, and puts them into the development lifecycle, right? So from the moment it leaves the source control systems until it gets deployed into the development, it's automated. The next step there is uh, there is this U release in the picture as well, because if you want to deploy to stage and production, you want to get some extra controls in there, right? Now, like I said, this isn't rocket science. This isn't something that is new. What is interesting is the way that we were able to wire this up with uh, intelligent automation for the cloud so that all of this gets provisioned for developers automatically on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So each time somebody um, starts a new project, they will actually um, go to the catalog, request this development pipeline, and it gets provisioned for them. They don't have to kind of go and set up all these individual components themselves, which is very time consuming. A few changes, and this goes back to that first slide on the fast IT, right? So a few changes that we had to make in the data centers for that is um, we had to API enable everything, right? So it starts with the um, infrastructure layers. So we API enable by implementing the ACI fabric, putting the APIC in the, in the middle. Next layer, OpenStack, getting the APIs from OpenStack, and then we move up the stack, right? So we have one specific project, um, which is called LAE, Lightweight Application Environment. It's based on OpenShift. So we get the um, APIs from there. And then that software delivery as a service provides us APIs for all the tooling around it, right? So the workload or um, the software delivery uh, chain I just showed you, that is actually part of that SDAS um, layer right up there. Now that we have the APIs, so the next step for us is basically putting the portal in front of it and getting the Cisco intelligent automation for the cloud wired up. So we have the workflows configured in CIAC, and that is actually talking to the APIs that you saw on the previous slide. And through the portal, which is uh, Cisco Prime uh, Services Catalog, right? That is actually going to CIAC, kicking off the workflows. So that is basically how we're able to implement that. So, it's not, we don't just use CAIC for the provisioning of the environments. We also use it for the um, setup of the development pipelines as well, right? 
now let's take a look at uh, what it looks like in, uh, in real life. So this is the view that our employees get. Um, this is basically how they request these uh, services. So um, again, Cisco's, uh, Cisco Prime uh, Services Catalog. Are you familiar with Catalog? Have you used it? All right. So we use it not just for infrastructure. So as you can see, this is just a home screen, right? We use it for collaboration uh, tools. If people want to get accounts on Box or WebEx or something like that, they go to this page and they can request it. We have software up, hooked up in there. Uh, network connectivity, and then this one will zoom in a little bit more, right? So this is um, our infrastructure services, and you can see th there is there is everything in there that developers would need, right? You have everything from data center resources to uh, application servers, databases, um, everything that they can request. So if we go there, So the first thing um, we'll look at is this one, um, so lightweight application environment. So basically, the request process um, is twofold, right? So we abstracted away the OpenShift or the, the native OpenShift uh, experience, at least for some part. And the reason we do that is because we want to get some controls. We want to hook it in with project management tools. Um, we want to have some access controls in there as well. Um, so we basically get have people first request a virtual um, or a, a lightweight application environment. And that allows them to basically set up um, a few, let's say, administrative items, right? Um, you give it a name. One of the interesting things here as well is um, so we can request between or we can differentiate between IT managed, which is where you would go to request a uh, formal project, right, with dev and stage and production life cycles. And actually, we support an arbitrary number of life cycles. And then you can also request a personal um, instance. So the personal instance allows you to um, just do some development on your own, right? Anybody at the company can go here and request um, a personal service. And whatever idea they have, they can just wire it up and uh, deploy it somewhere, show it, show it to people, and then do the socialization, right? So that actually helps with the whole innovation aspect as well. Um, so basically, then uh, what you do is um, you have the opportunity to select like your service plan, right? We have pre predefined a few service plans. Um, you define where you want to deploy it. This is the access control management I was talking about. So you can specify, OK, who is in your team? Who needs admin access? Who needs other types of access? Who are your regular um, application team members? Um, you put them in there. And then you have some additional um, information around your accounting and your projects um, that gets hooked in with the project management solutions, right? So that's step number one. Um, that is creating your context for the application. So the next step where you go to is you order the actual application. And you'll see that there is a little bit more details in here. So it preloads information that I um, uh, requested in the previous step, plus some additional information from my accounts, right? So um, I select which environment I uh, want to work with. It recognizes that I already have one. I give it an application name. Uh, I select location uh, for the personal account. This is just my personal instance here. Uh, we have RTP as one location. Uh, for the managed IT uh, instances, we have more locations. We can select which technology we want to build on. Um, so for this one, let's build a Node.js application. Uh, again, life cycles, I don't have a choice here because I haven't, I'm in the personal instance, but I would basically get like dev or stage or any type of uh, environment I want for the, um, for the formal projects. Security regime, so if I select external, um, this actually initiates the step to get external access, right? We can um, give uh, application teams DMZ access. Um, let's make this one internal. Again, sizing information and additional information around which cartridges. So you'll see that this is where the OpenShift details shine through, right? So this is basically asking me which cartridges um, I need from an OpenShift point of view. Uh, so I, I can select databases or additional services here, messaging capabilities. Uh, let's see what else is there. 
so protocol information, basically that kind of concludes it, right? You see it's, it's fairly manageable, right? Um, for developers, it's fairly quick. It's a few minutes. They request this information, and then they're gone, and then they're done, um, and then they can actually start deploying their applications. So basically what we did now is if I go to this slide, we requested this, this last piece here, right? So the, the target environments, that is what we set up now. So that is step number one. Now the second step in our um, um, request process is basically getting this um, whole software delivery flow uh, requested. And the way we do that is, again, I go to middleware services. And then right here below, you see software development stack, right? So I want to create that. I click on order. All right. So this is a fairly lengthy form, you'll see. I'll have to kind of scroll through that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the contrast with the individual components, right? So this typically takes developers, again, a few minutes to fill in, right, if they know what, what uh, type of services they need. Um, and then they get the environment provision. So let's kind of quickly walk through this. So the first thing they'll, uh, they'll do is um, specify that they want to have a new um, SDAS stack. They can also click no and then start to modify one, right? So uh, let's call this my diff stack group name, which team you're in, right? So I'm in CITS. I'm in IT architecture. Then I specify my runtime environment. So we just requested that, right? So I requested an LAE environment, so the OpenShift environment. So I say, OK, I want uh, to set up a delivery pipeline for that environment. And it also kind of implies that we do this for other environments as well, right? We have this for, um, uh, for the um, BPM environments. We have this for our traditional um, hosting environments, which, are, uh, pre which predate the um, OpenShift environment. Then I provide a name. Um, so this, these are. Um, projects I previously requested through the um, screens I showed you earlier. Um, there, there is a version uh, number associated with that. You see it kind of pre-populates as I go through this form. And now we get to the interesting bits. So it asks me, do you want to have a version control system? Yep, sure I do. Um, I can select between Git and Subversion. So this is all configurable, right? So within your company, you can basically specify the choices that you want. You can say, oh, I just want people to use one. I just want them to use Git. And then you can actually hardwire this. If you want to give them the choice, you can do that. So it's not really the, um, like I said earlier on the slides, it's not really the, the specific components that we chose. It is really the fact that you wire them up and you kind of make this solution your own, right? Uh, for, for your company, it might look completely different, so to speak. So version control system, so that is basically this part right here. Then the continuous integration, yep, we want that. Um, it doesn't need a lot of, oops, it doesn't need, need a lot of extra information. The only thing it needs is, do I build my application using Ant or Maven? Let's select Maven here, and then it asks me for a configuration plan. We don't have options here, it just have the standard plan, which includes the sonar cube testing. So what we did here is basically we said, I want this Jenkins component with sonar cube in there. If teams don't care about one or the other, they can uh, leave that out. Then the next step here is the uh, artifact repository. Yep, we want to push uh, our components there so that we can also, so this also allows. Um, application developers to share components with each other, right? So if the code gets pushed into Artifactory, that is just basically your Maven repository. Um, other people that might want to depend on your code, they can just pull it in from there um, and, and integrate with it that way. And then the last, um, or one of the last bits I have to fill in is this um, SRA flow, the service release uh, automation flow. And that is basically referring to this last bit right here, right? So the, you deploy, you release. Um, and it asked me some specific information. LEE, there is only one uh, template that is available for right now. Um, and this is specific to Maven, right? So this is um, also a technicality. So for some of the other delivery flows, we have more options than this. And then the developers have a choice. Um, we also collect some information from the app teams about compliance. So this allows them to kind of fill in whether, they, uh, whether their project is uh, compliant or needs to be compliant with SOX. And that's virtually it, right? So a few more details on the life cycles. They hit submit, and then the environment gets provisioned for them. So basically what they get is this entire stack. So we filled in just 
with, let's say, two and a half forms, right? The first is like the, 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 the setting up the environment for LAE environment, request uh, LAE for the release environments, and then we set it up um, the, the continuous delivery flow. So just for those who are unfamiliar with, for example, Jenkins, this is the view in Jenkins, right? So this is actually for the project I just shared, right? Um, I didn't, I pre-provisioned I pre this because it does take typically like, like 10 minutes or so with all the integrations to uh, um, the group management and stuff like that. It takes um, something like that. So I, I pre-set it up just to show you just M Jenkins alone, right? It's, uh, for those of you who've worked with it, they know there are quite a few bells and whistles, which is good, but it's bad as well, right? So this is good because it gives you flexibility. Let me kind of scroll through this window. So this is what you would normally have to kind of configure for individual programs or projects. So there is a lot of things you can configure, but there is also a lot of mistakes you can make there. So what we prevent application teams from doing is having to actually set this up for each and every project. So we basically pre-wire this information for them. They can come in here and make changes. I can actually go in here and uh, make certain changes, uh, but I don't have to, right? For most of the projects, they will just request the software delivery stacks and use it as is. They don't really want to mess with it, right? And then uh, the, one, the, one, the other thing that uh, I'll quickly show here is, uh, so this is the um, code testing we've integrated as well. So these are the types of tests that, that are pre-wired. Again, nothing specific to the uh, software delivery as a service per se, but these are the kinds of things you can wire in. And so at the end of the day, um, when the developer comes in um, the next day, they'll get a report like this. They can easily see which issues their code, the previous, um, the code they added the previous day uh, introduced. They can fix these things and then move on with their, uh, with their business, right? Again, this is just specific to the Sonar Cube solution we have, uh, we have in use. If you have other ways of testing your code, you can easily integrate it in the same type of flows, right? There are a few things that we're doing um, as next steps. Uh, one is about cloud native applications. We, like I said, we have um, a couple of people that are trying to figure out, okay, what are some of these criteria for cloud native applications? Um, and how do we kind of make that manageable and uh, consumable by application teams without them having to do things like implementing load balancing and resiliency and all these different things, right? We want to make it easy for them to use. Um, and then uh, the next thing that we're looking at is um, something I've been talking to some colleagues here um, th over the... Um, um, last couple of days, actually, is instead of going to the catalog and clicking all these buttons and requesting environments, what we want to do is add some metadata to your application as we build it, and then have these environments, both the deployment environments as well as your delivery pipelines, kind of pre-configured for you, right? So what we would ha what we would still have is the automation um, as part of your project stacks, but you wouldn't have the button clicking in front of it, right? So that kind of gets pre-wired for it. So. That's about it.